So, Jamer Hunt is our keynote for today. He is currently the Vice Provost of the Transdisciplinary Initiatives at the New School, where he was the founding director between 2009 and 2015 of the Parsons Graduate Program in Transdisciplinary Design. He also serves as a visiting design researcher at the Institute of Design in UMA, Sweden, with Paula Antonelli at the MoMA. He was co-creator and award-winning uh, of the award-winning creator, creator, you know, sorry, a long day, exactly, experiment design and violence between 2013 and 2015, a multi-platform project that generated an online exhibition, public debates, educational projects, and a book. Together, they have also collaborated on Mind08, the design and Elastic Mind Symposium 2008, and Headspace on Scent as Design 2010. His practice, Big Plus Tall Design, combines conceptual, collaborative, and communication design, and he is co-founder with Hallery J of Design Philadelphia, now the largest city-based design festival in the US. So I, I met Jamer in maybe five years ago, 2012, at um, at the Beirut Design Week, actually, and we we're talking about the future of education uh, and design. And it's probably since many futures happened, and I'm looking forward to hear where your journey in design led you, and uh, I think you have a lot to share with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Simon. Thank you all. It's been a long afternoon. Thank you for staying. Can everybody hear me all right? Yeah? yeah. Um, I'm used to yelling, so. Uh, so, you know, first of all, thank you to Simon so much for this invitation. Uh, you know, when he asked me to come give a talk on well-being, I warned him, I know little to nothing about well-being. I know nothing about the topic. Um, and my most recent work has been on violence, which is kind of the opposite of well-being. <laughs> and he said, no, 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 I, th I think this is good. And I said, all right, we'll give it a try. Um, so. Uh, you know, halfway through, if you're ready to go home and, you know, get a drink, you can blame Simon uh, for inviting me here today. Um, but it is a, um, it, it's remarkable to be here this weekend for a lot of reasons. Um, and I was supposed to fly in last night, my flight was canceled. Um, last night was a particularly significant day for, uh, for many of us, especially flying from, say, the United States to Canada. Um, <laughs> You know, what else is there to say? <laughs> it's not a fair fight. We get the orange overlord. You get Justin. <laughs> Remarkably today, when I was trying to find a photo of your He-Man Prime Minister, I, um, I started typing into Google Justin, and you know, it auto-completes. Guess who's number one? And it's not the Beeb. It's your own Justin, Justin Trudeau, number one before the Bieber. Your own Bieber, of course. Um, so this is, you know, this, this is a bit of the background uh, for, for me today coming here. Um, so I really want to thank Simon especially because um, as I texted my wife and kids, um, I'll see them in four years. And um, it's, been, uh, it's been lovely to come to Canada today, tomorrow, the next day, the next day. Um, <laughs> It's a fine city, and uh, I ain't leaving. Um, so enjoy your time with Justin. Um, things can change. We had the coolest leader in history, uh, and look what we got now. Um, and I was also reminded, uh, so I, I was reminded a bit um, of this, which came out in 2004. Um, and my, uh, my apologies to those of faith who might find this uh, insulting. Um, but this was, you know, this was after we had the um, kind of wicked stupidity not only to have elected George W. Bush, but to re-elect him after he staged a, a kind of a fake war, which cost us many lives and a lot of resources uh, and ruined a good part of the globe. Um, and we live with the results since then. So um, this was, uh, you know, sort of the remaking uh, of uh, our relationship uh, after George Bush had been re-elected in the United States, and it feels really relevant today, um, again. And so, I couldn't help but resurrect that. And it was, um, 
you know, in light of all this, uh, and sort of thinking back to this time, um, that I started to think about what I want to talk about and some of the ideas that have been going through my head. And I've been haunted for a number of different reasons by a figure from this era um, and by something he said, somebody uh, I don't look up to, um, someone uh, whom, with whom you may be familiar. Um, but he, there's an expression he used, there's a quote I used in a strange uh, venue um, that's really been on my mind for quite a long time. And so this is it. So the person who said it is Donald Rumsfeld, our U.S. Secretary of Defense under George Bush, um, George W. Bush. Uh, and what he said, which has been sort of, uh, as I said, kind of haunting me for quite a long time, is the following. As we know, there are no knowns. There are things we know we know. We also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things we do not know. But there are also unknown unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. Um, I could probably spend my time, uh, which is uh, generously longer than the, everyone else, um, to actually just talk about the last few presentations, because they were so good. Um, so I'm going to kind of take us out, away from well-being, bring it back towards well-being, um, and we'll see if we can get there by the end. So upon reading this, and, and being surprised that someone like Rumsfeld, who's not known as a kind of intellectual, um, <coughs> Uh, that he would have, that he would state in this weird, you know, sort of uh, briefing, State Department briefing or something, um, uh, about the kind of state of the counterinsurgency movement in Afghanistan after 9-11 and after the, you know, sort of artificially uh, uh, jacked up war in Iraq, um, that he would come up with a statement like this to me was fascinating. It's stuck with me since then. Um, and so I started to try and think through it, and the first thing I did was I started to think about, is there a way I can kind of plot this? Um, and one of the things that's kind of funny about trying to come up with a sort of a graph of what this means um, is that you get kind of two coordinate axes um, that are the same thing. One goes from the known to the unknown, the other goes from the known to the unknown, which I think kind of doesn't make sense um, from a sort of graphing standpoint. Um, it is maybe... In, philosophy, what we might call a tautology, sort of a thing that kind of eats its own tail. Um, but nonetheless, I wanted, to, I wanted to see if I could learn something um, by putting his words into a slightly different context. And so if you then start to kind of, uh, you know, map the spaces here, you have in your upper left um, the known knowns. Yeah, no, and then he went on to talk about, of course, the known unknowns, um, the things that we know that we don't know. He mentioned again, and lastly, the unknown unknowns, those things we don't know that we don't know. Now, one of the things that became apparent to me in doing this exercise, as well as uh, it was brought to my attention through someone, and I wish I had written down the name at the time, someone on the internet who sort of was reflecting upon his speech and, and mentioned this, is that he didn't cover all the territory. There's another quadrant here that he doesn't address. Um, and that is, it's, a it's actually a kind of tricky one. Um, and that one is the unknown knowns. Now, you know, starting to try and understand what these different things mean, I'll give you kind of a, 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 a historically maybe appropriate way of thinking about uh, how we might start to understand what these different categories are and kind of the work that they do. Um, so the known known at the time that Rumsfeld was probably referring to, or, you know, could have been referring to, was the fact that Al-Qaeda was plotting. That was a known known. State Department, people like him, knew that kind of thing. But if we move down then to the known unknowns, you could start to think of that as, you know, we knew that Al-Qaeda was assembling somewhere in Afghanistan or Pakistan or the border, but we didn't know exactly where. So that's the known unknown. We knew they were doing something, we didn't know where they were doing it, how they were doing it, etc. If we then jump up to the unknown knowns, the upper left quadrant, what we get there the unknown knowns, the things we didn't know we knew, we had intelligence in the United States and probably globally um, that basically said that this was going to happen and we could now go back forensically into that and find that. All the clues were there. We, it was an unknown known. We didn't know that we knew it at the time. And finally, if you get to the category of the unknown unknowns, to me that's sort of the idea that Al-Qaeda was not in Pakistan, Afghanistan, that Al-Qaeda 
was training in flight schools in the United States, right in our backyards, that somehow we had no idea that they were us, that they were here. That was the unknown unknown. And so thinking through these different categories, I started trying to understand kind of, again, what's the work that they do? What, can we talk about them in ways that are more familiar? So the known knowns, you know, you might describe just simply as knowledge. It's sort of the things that we assume to be true. Now, that doesn't mean they're fact. That doesn't mean they're true. They're known knowns. Uh, I think we, we heard earlier um, about symbolic truth and, and uh, uh, everyday life truth and other kinds of truth. And so, um, you know, we live in a post-truth world, um, so knowledge is, you know, contested. But knowledge is still, you know, knows sort of the things we understand uh, to be known. Whereas the no no, the, excuse me, I, I have this one critical problem, which is I always say these wrong, and they're basically the same word over and over again, and to mix them up is really undercuts my mission here. Um, but anyway, so the known unknowns are research. That's sort of what research is. It's, a, it's kind of exploration. It's seeking. We know there are things that we don't know, so we should go find out what they are. And so research is kind of a way of describing the known unknowns. This one I really struggled with. I, st I still am not sure that I have the right term for it, but let's call it criticism. Um, another way we might think about it is ideology, but I won't get into that one for today. Um, I call it criticism in the sense that, you know, if we go out and buy a Prius, and we say, well, by buying a Prius, I'm saving the world. Well, cri what criticism tells you is, well, actually, no, that's kind of not true. And you sort of know that's not true. You're not saving the world. You're just slowing down the rate of destroying the world. Um, and so the, the unknown knowns is really the, the truths that we sort of don't want to admit to ourselves, don't want to really um, claim that we know. And so criticism is not quite the right word, but I'm getting there. Finally, um, the unknown unknowns. And the term I used here is speculation. And I'm not sure, again, it's exactly the right term, and I'll get at, through a few examples, what I mean by speculation. But it's trying to create a space, and I think Len in his last presentation um, gave us a great example, of producing conditions where new things can emerge that you can't expect. And I want to kind of hold your attention on this quadrant because this is, I think, design at its very best is when you can get to the unknown unknowns. And design often sort of seeps over into the known unknowns. In other words, we sort of know what we need to design, and it needs to be a little better, and you know, we should improve it, and we kind of get there. But when design gets us to the unknown unknowns, it's doing something remarkable. Something deep, something powerful, something transformative. And so I want to kind of take us into that space a bit by a slight detour. So according to the WHO, from 2000 to 2012, the ninth leading cause of death globally was road injury, otherwise known as car crashes. And in a certain sense, this information for all of you is kind of the unknown known. Right? We get into a car, we don't think much about it. We get into a plane, we're afraid it's going to crash. Statistically, everybody knows the story that a plane is much less likely to crash than a car, um, and yet we pretend to not know it. Um, and so we get into a car with no fear, um, we get into an airplane, uh, and you know, we make sure there's a vomit bag. Um, so this is kind of the fact of a certain way that we operate in the world. But come to find out that the numbers of crashes rose by 30% during that period. So things are actually getting worse. And then if you look to the United States, recent data is showing that after years of that number declining, that it's leapt up again by a significant amount and there's some concern that it may be texting and driving that's doing that. Um, in any case, the number of crashes rose by 30% during that period. So the question that sort of provokes me is, do the designers of cars and the signage and the interfaces and the roadways and the infrastructure, do they bear any responsibility for those 1.3 million deaths every year? Is there a connection there? Now obviously, 
you know, for this sort of exercise, I'm, I'm not suggesting that you know, designers make cars and give them to people. Um, they are part of a massive industry that involves you know, sales and marketing and mining and advertising and all of this kind of stuff. Um, but still, I think we have to ask ourselves as designers, do we bear any responsibility for those 1.3 million deaths each year? And if the answer is yes, then what? What do we do about that? And what was striking to me was that we seem to never have these conversations in design. And yet, designers are responsible for toys that children can swallow, buildings that people trip through or that fall on them. Credit default swaps of kind of financial design that robs people of their livelihoods, of their dignity. Of pajamas that light on fire, of medicine caps that the elderly and the disabled can't open, and of text messages that kill people and bully people. And so, is there, a, you know, I've been wondering about this for a long time. Why in design are we always talking about design saving the world? And we never talk about this other stuff. And so that's why with Paola Antonelli, we started this project called Design and Violence. And we started this in sort of uh, 2000, well, probably uh, 12, was it that long ago? Yes. <laughs> Uh, and what we wanted to do is we wanted to create sort of conditions to explore the unanticipated consequences of design. In other words, the unknown unknowns, the unanticipated consequences of design, the things designers couldn't know that would be true. In an interesting way, I have a colleague, Maya Wiley, who recently, just the other night, described design as a form of policy that objects make us do things in ways that policy sort of mimics in some ways. They shift our behavior. And so, in, uh, in 2013, we launched this unique experiment. Um, and it was an exhibition that sort of unraveled over time. It was not a physical exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art, it was an online exhibition. And what we wanted to do was, in some sense, to create kind of the, the conditions, the infrastructure for the unknown unknowns to emerge, for us to learn things we couldn't even predict, the unanticipated. And so we, we called it a, an online curatorial experiment. And it gave us a few sort of affordances that, that are really different from traditional exhibitions. And one of them was we could open it up to a lot of people to comment on, because it was online. And the second was that it could evolve over time that what we did on the first day did not necessarily have to be the same thing we did on the second. We could learn and change across time. And so, for us, the, the, um, the kind of definition of violence uh, that we use is that desire to, violence is a manifestation of the power to alter the circumstances around us against the will of others and to their detriment. And the exhibition had been inspired in many ways by a book that Steven Pinker had published called The Better Angels of Our Nature. And in it, it's a, it's a massive book, 700 pages. I think he had a lot of research assistants helping him. If you know his work, he's a linguist, but also sort of a public intellectual. And he made a really provocative argument. What he said was, despite all of the apparent evidence that we are becoming globally, historically, less and less violent. And you kind of go like, wait a minute, like no. Absolutely not. You know, 20th century, genocides, how many? We can count them, or maybe on two hands. You know, that, that just, you know, sort of seems ludicrous. And yet he makes a really convincing argument through this book that, in fact, violence is on the decrease and has been for a long time. We weren't quite comfortable with that, Paolo and I. We felt like violence had shifted. It had moved and morphed and had become other, other kinds of things than just sort of murders and beatings and things like that. We were also inspired by a, a famous quote from a kind of rabble-rouser in design, Victor Papanek, who in 1971 wrote, there are professions more harmful than industrial design, but only a very few of them. Um, and for those who are curious which ones he thought were more harmful, advertising. Um, so uh, uh, Papanek, for his sort of rabble-rousing, uh, was basically blacklisted. Uh, from the IDSA, the Industrial Design Society of America, uh, he was blacklisted for drawing criticism towards design. An interesting sign of the times in 1971. But so we were inspired by these ideas, trying to understand how do we account for, how do we think through the, the incredible ambiguity 
that exists in design between creation and destruction. The, des the design community tends to always focus on the creative and the creation. That we make things and we add beauty to the world. And that's true. And that's why I'm in the profession. But there's another side to it. And aren't we adult enough to talk about that? Haven't we reached a point professionally where we're sort of saturated in the industry where we can admit maybe we have a few warts? I think we are. And so what we decided to do for this exhibition was pair together controversial, ambiguous, ambivalent projects that seem to speak something about design with writers who came primarily from outside of design, public intellectuals, who could help us to understand how design works in the world and how it creates a sense of threat or not. And we were inspired, uh, Paolo particularly, initially by a project that we featured. This is uh, a project called Defense Distributed by Cody Wilson, and this is um, really the, the plans, the code for a 3D printed gun. And Cody Wilson is really interesting in part because he does this uh, really as a provocateur, almost as a kind of speculative designer in the sense of Tony Don and Fiona Ravi. Um, that is, he used this to challenge our notion of free speech. And he fought this with the US courts. The, the US government shut down the circulation. So the way that this worked was he created the plans for 3D printers um, and then distributed through file exchange um, those plans for people to print guns anywhere in the world. You just had to download the, the plans and um, the file, and then you could print that using your own 3D printer. Terrifying prospect, you know, made of a material that scanners can't necessarily detect. And so, you know, we were fascinated at the kind of provocation that this creates. Um, and we were also beginning to say that, understand that violence was mutating and shifting in our everyday experience, that it was becoming immaterial. And so this was a project we featured called the Digital Attack Map uh, that Google created. And what this does is it maps all of the DDoS Denial, uh, distributed denial of service attacks um, that go on around the world. And it does it live. You can go on it right now, and you can see, you can sort of play it back and forth through time and see where these things are happening. Who is attacking whom? And these are the, these are the kinds of um, cyber attacks that take down most of the big uh, entities that you hear about when a company's been hacked. And, it, and it's, uh, they're cheap to acquire. They're cheap to purchase online, a few hundred dollars and you can take down major companies with them. And so we were getting at the notion that violence was shifting and changing. We featured this project by Masoud Hassani, an Afghani, who grew up both with uh, beautiful tumbleweeds that he would play with with his friends, but also with minefields of unexploded IEDs. And so he designed this remarkable object that could be blown by the wind across fields and then, as it rolled across an IED, would detonate the IED. It could absorb the impact and still keep rolling. And for that, we were able to get Jody Williams, who won a Nobel Peace Prize for her work on demining, to talk about the urgent national need, uh, international need, uh, for new ways of thinking about demining. And speaking of mining in a different way, we also looked at the violence of kind of um, large-scale environmental degradation. This is mountaintop removal. And we were able to get Andrew McCaskey, who is an Appalachian journalist and activist, uh, to write about the kind of uh, both environmental violence of this as well as the cultural violence um, of this attack on these mountains where literally the, uh, you know, the, the, the tops of mountains are removed for our resources. And we were able to get Judge Shira Scheindlin, um, a name you might not be familiar with, um, to write a piece on this which is called the Bite Spit Mask. And it was also featured with flexicuffs, the sort of zip tie handcuffs that police use. And the reason she's significant is she was the judge in New York who shut down the stop and frisk program in New York City, which uh, Mayor Bloomberg had used for a number of years. Uh, and it was deemed to be unconstitutional. You might have, uh, if you followed our uh, you know, presidential campaign at all, you might have heard the Orange Overlord uh, refer to bringing back stop and frisk, even though it's unconstitutional, immoral, and ineffective and yet somehow it just rings true to his ears. And so uh, we, were to get, we were able to get Judge Shira Shine then again, trying to understand how the legal process sees these artifacts that designers make. This artifact is used to actually um, keep people who've been detained from spitting onto officers. 
It, it surely plays a significant role, but also dehumanizes people who are being taken into custody. And, and by the way, that's my son. I took that photograph. Um, really a proud moment as a father. <laughs> to see your son in a bike spit mask. I'm just like, I'm so hoping he doesn't go to jail at some point and blame this all on me. Um, so, um, you know, we wanted to understand, and what we discovered along the way, and this is part of the, the kind of, um, the unknown unknowns of devising this very open platform for this exhibition to evolve, was we really found in the beginning that we were featuring projects that tended to be kind of clever design projects that sort of address violence somehow. But we weren't, what we learned over time, partly through the comments we were getting back, is that the violence, the experience of that violence, we, we weren't really drawing on people who had been, uh, had sort of first-hand experience of that. And, and as a result, it, we really risked turning it into kind of a fetish. Um, and that was our biggest fear. And so we started to try and shift the narrative expand the kinds of topics we're dealing with, bring in different voices. So we're really fortunate, for instance, to bring in uh, Chandra Wuluruntu, who is from Indonesia. This is a project by the Public Practice Studio. Um, and this is a project for women who are being trafficked, and particularly sex trafficked. And this project is really brilliant. It's hidden within um, a maxi pad uh, box. And it's instructions. And so the idea being that you know, the mostly men who are doing the trafficking will never kind of put their hands on something like this, so it's hidden to them. And yet, it's accessible to the women who really need it. And what's even more brilliant about this project is that um, at the risk of this being found on them, what you can do at the very bottom, you see there's a little tab you can pull off with numbers. They look like kind of the, the, the numbers you're supposed to play in the daily lottery. Um, that's actually the telephone number for the helpline if you look just above it. And so you can tear that off and have it sort of innocently on you. Uh, without communicating to your captive, captors that you are being, uh, that you are looking for a way out. And her harrowing story, someone she had been uh, trafficked from Indonesia, ended up in the United States, um, was a remarkable story about how prevalent this is, how hidden under the radar it is, how much it is a kind of unknown known, how much of our economies survive upon this kind of labor. Or we were able to get a piece by China Ketetsi, who was a Ugandan child soldier. And at the age of eight, she was given an AK-47, probably the most efficient, effective, and best designed weapon in human history, aside from perhaps the atom bomb. And what was remarkable in hearing her story was that this had become for her a kind of friend. So alienated was she being conscripted into, as a child soldier at age eight, that the AK-47 became kind of like a stuffed animal or a toy for her, a pal, a friend, a re remarkable relationship about the true complexity, the depth, the strangeness, the unpredictability, the unknown unknowns of what violence can do. Who could have imagined that an AK-47 can become something that is a child's friend, something they rely on for strength and power? And. Not all of our responses were in the form of written responses, though most of them were. This was a project by Yosuke Ushigome called Commoditized Warfare. Um, just very briefly, the project was meant as a sort of speculative design project to propose a way in which nations can resolve differences through kind of spectacularized sport rather than warfare. But what I, what I, wanted to, what I want to show you is actually the response to this. So we asked Christoph Niemann, who's just one of the world's most brilliant uh, illustrators to respond to this project about kind of the repurposing of warfare. And so he responded visually as we had hoped he would. Um, and so uh, this is uh, one of his projects. <laughs> Here's another. <laughs> And it's just like a great, you know, as only he can. <laughs> this is so much sort of of military culture, um, so much of, you know, warfare, uh, and yet so beautiful, so simple, uh, so effective. And finally, uh, the last one. Um. <laughs> So we wanted to understand sort of the, 
you know, violence from a lot of different perspectives. It, it didn't all have to be horror stories. It plays sort of different roles in our lives. Um, but one of the things that was really essential to me in all of this uh, was the fact that by putting this online, separate from a physical exhibition, by putting it online, we could open it up to comments. And Paola at the MoMA was very nervous about opening up to comments because we were dealing with some very controversial material and they were worried about the trolls coming and just sort of shutting the thing down. But we managed throughout to have an, an amazing kind of um, response of really substantive uh, discussions. And, so one of them, which I'll read to you, um, came early, um, and it went something like this. Today, army pins, yesterday heels. The internet requires extremely warped sense of gimmickry, and violence certainly fits the bill. But it's just another meaningless brand wrapped on multiple justifications. Perhaps museums can now classify the new hot style is the month, you know, new hot style of the month is violence, so chic, so 2013. Once an object is stamped as violent by the MoMA, does that make it so? The inherent problem with showing symbols and pictures of violent design away from the context is an extreme fetishization of those symbols. And that was our real fear, was that as a museum like the Museum of Modern Art, and we thought, Paul and I thought about whether we should have it host a museum or not, and we chose to because it is a large platform that reaches a lot of people. We thought that was important. But we also knew that people would come after us because the museum is a museum of aesthetics, by and large, in its history, not of politics. And so, what would it mean for us to, to begin to explore this work? And early on, people felt, and rightly so, I think, that we were moving into this realm of aestheticizing violence, playing with violence. But the comments also provided us with other unknown unknowns, and this was one of them. So this is a post um, by Ingrid Newkirk about Temple Grandin's Serpentine Ramp. And if you're familiar with this project, Temple Grandin uh, devised this ramp uh, as a more humane way to slaughter cattle. Um, and Ingrid Newkirk is the founder of People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, or the director, I should say. And so she wrote a piece for us about sort of the relative merits of this project. Uh, and her position was uh, that she would rather slaughter be, she would rather cattle be slaughtered humanely than inhumanely. And so as much as she abhorred the idea of slaughtering animals for any purpose, better to have it done humanely than inhumanely. You don't want to piss off the animal rights activists. <laughs> wow. Um, they come at you. 128 comments. If this is an issue that you're interested in, design and violence, go look at the comment section. It's brilliant. It's deep. It's long. It's thoughtful. Amazing conversation. Ingrid jumps back in. Um, it's a really extended philosophical, political discussion about what it means to kill animals and to live off that. So I highly recommend it, it was amazing. We did a public debate around this issue as well, and some of my students were like, those vegans are really scary. But I feel like I can't talk to, next to them, I don't want to raise their hand because they're so... Anyway, uh, I'm a vegetarian, but, uh, you know, don't want to disparage vegans. So 128 comments for the slaughtering of animals. Our last post that ended Design and Violence was a post about the lethal injection cocktail, the design of death by the state. And we were incredibly fortunate to, be, to get Ricky Jackson uh, to uh, sort of interview and write for this final post. And Ricky Jackson had been accused of a crime, had been jailed, was on death row. He spent 39 years in prison, some of that on death row. He was exonerated. He was the longest serving exonerated prisoner in United States history. And so, after 39 years in prison, he was exonerated by DNA evidence. And he wrote eloquent, talked eloquently about what it means to live under the specter of state-sponsored sponsored death. How many comments do you think we got about this one? Two. Kill an animal? 128 comments. Kill a human? Two. One of the unknown unknowns. I didn't realize people felt this way about other humans. Didn't know they felt that way about animals. Interesting, kind of unknown, unknown, that it, you know, only by creating an open platform could we sort of discover these strange sorts of truths. So I want to tell you about one project in particular, and I'm now starting to move over back towards well-being, I promise. Um, 
uh, though, though we get to our darkest moment. Um, so this is a project by Julie Jonas Corbonis, uh, who is a speculative design project. He was at the Royal College of Art. Um, it's interesting, he, had, he was from Eastern Europe. His family had a background in building um, uh, fairground rides. And what he was, this is called the Euthanasia Roller Coaster. And his idea here was that uh, for those people who saw an end to their life, uh, that rather than the sort of expedient ways, you know, the Kevorkian death machines, etc., why not create something that's exhilarating? So this is an idea for a roller coaster where as you get up to that top peak and then you plummet down, the gravitational forces are so strong that as you start to do those smaller and smaller um, circles, the centrifugal force is so strong that it actually um, sort of deoxygenates your brain and you die. And so it's a, it's a way to think about what it means to create a different end-of-life experience. And we had a neuroscientist uh, talk about, you know, he was the one who wrote the response to this and suggested that one of the things that made him very nervous was the idea that people who might be thinking about death have sort of exhilarating, fun, uh, exciting ways to end their lives, a, a very reasonable position. But then this comment came across. And this, of all the comments of all the posts, uh, was the most remarkable to me. Another second kind of unknown unknown. Your post extends from a singular premise that death is, death is necessarily a tragedy. As someone who's in pain every day, I do not believe this is the case. Sometimes life is the tragedy. When, only, when one's only experience is, the, is overwhelming pain, it is a tragedy to be prevented release. For, men are there, for many, there is only one option for release, and that is the final option. I feel likely that one day in the distant future, I may choose this option myself. Doing so through the experience of something so amazing that the human body cannot withstand it sounds a whole lot better to me than a boring gray room. To remove all violence from humanity would be to utterly sanitize life, to remove the experience of anything but graves. Certainly the specter of interpersonal violence is undesirable, but I wish to be violently happy, violently sad, violently moved. I wish to feel violent acceleration and violent relief. Conflating violence with anything that challenges us is to remove all value from the human experience, to paint the world gray. You know, I had chills when I read this. I had never had that perspective on what life and death could mean. The messiness, the complexity of it. You know, this is, we have so few opportunities to really consider this. And to me, this is the kind of unknown unknown. This is what speculation brings you. A more complex notion of our life a deeper notion of what violence, that violence may have a role to play in our lives as a kind of intensity. And so finally, I'm going to get around to design in the pursuit of well-being. Um, and so why do we need these unknown unknowns in the search for well-being? Now, this word well-being, which I don't think I've said probably more than twice in my life until today, um, is a fascinating word in and of itself. Just the word itself is so sort of resonant. Um, this is how I think of the word well-being. Such a beautiful, soft, mellifluous word, well-being. You know, it brings up incredible sort of connotations. Um, but this is often in design how we think of well-being, how we image well-being, how we design well-being. This is called a smart room. And this is where we are in design. The kind of depositing of kind of cheap fantasies about the world. That well-being is often imaged in design as a kind of happy, fit, white person doing something active. <laughs> I think of it as the kind of happy white people doing yoga image. Sorry, Tata Yoga. And, and also, just as, you know, like, first of all, has, has counting somehow exceeded our cognitive load? Like, I can't jump rope without counting. And like, why do we need something to do the one thing you do naturally when you jump rope? I don't think we need that, but I'll leave that aside for a moment. But this is kind of, you know, this is well-being as design designs well-being. It's the known unknowns. It's the sort of, these weird fantasies of a kind of well-being. It's always shaped by a kind of cinematic imagination of healthy, fit people doing kind of the right things by design. And this, for example, is a kind of lifestyle fantasy from Segway. This is one of their newer products. 
segue. You know, um, this is you know this is you'll dance with your girlfriend and you'll hang out with cool people by graffiti. That's what Segway will do for you. This is well-being. This is the kind of well-being that design traditionally brings us. And this is great. I mean, uh, you know, bless the Segway. Um, but you know, this is the Segway. Arrive in style. No one arrives in style in a Segway. <laughs> First of all, the helmet kind of does you in. Um, not, not good for the hair. Second of all, this fantasy of the Segway as this, you know, this lifestyle enabler. Oh, by the way, did you happen to know the owner of the company of the Segway drove a Segway off a cliff and died? Oh. This is true. So this weird fantasy that we tell us about well-being this uncomplexified, unnuanced, overly simplified fantasy. This is what bothers me. And it moves even into other realms. You know, the life straw, kind of a design, the design trumpets as its sort of, um, its, uh, you know, great emblem of doing good in the world. Well, you know what? Total failure. You know who buys these now? Rich hikers. Get a load of this. This is what the design notion of a kind of well-being is, that Oxycontin will take you fishing. Hell. Or it'll take you walking, Oxycontin, a step in the right direction. Or Oxycontin, swing is alive with Oxycontin. Here's the jazz CD to accompany your sort of, um, you know, unresolvable addiction. And so, how can we get how can we get beyond these kinds of fictional pap uh, that designers, we all perpetuate um, around the notion of well-being? Can we get to something else, something deeper, something that we can't quite picture? What is there to do? Now, design's culpability, design's role in violence, its role in the car crashes, its role in all of this, you know, there's one option, which is kind of the public health option. This is sort of the known unknowns. This is design taking itself more seriously, and this is what it should do, where we're starting to build metrics, models of change. Public health, whenever anyone does in public health or in health itself, in that field, whenever you do an intervention into an existing system, you don't do what designers do, which is do the intervention, run away, and pat yourself on the back. What you do is you actually test it. You see if it works. You measure it. And if it doesn't work, you don't do it because it might kill people. When's the last time a designer did that? Something they produced and said, well, I better actually make sure that it works. Make sure that it sells, that's usually one way we test it and measure it. But this sort of public health option, the idea that designers should be more multidisciplinary, more inclusive, this is absolutely true and we should do these things. These are the known unknowns. We need to move, or it's probably even the known knowns, we need to move in this direction. But this doesn't get at what I'm trying to get at today about the unknown unknowns, about design creating a space for a different way of thinking. And I was brought back by this, and this is my mother, who has Alzheimer's, and she's 82, and, you know, she is not the person I grew up with, but my father, who takes care of her, has done an amazing job taking she has something called, that my, my wife's a physician, and she described it as Lowy body syndrome, which means she's, she doesn't move very well anymore, she doesn't move at all. And so my father, who's 83, just had a broken hip, lifts her out of bed, lifts her, does all these things. And whenever I'm home, I try and help. And I cook her breakfast, and lunch, and dinner, and I feed her, and I bathe her. And I have to say, my mother also has a colostomy. Um, and so that needs to be changed. And, you know, there's only my father and me when we're home. And so, you know, the number of times that I have been in the situation of a son holding his naked mother, uh, you know, by the arms to keep the poop from getting all over her while my father changes the bag and she's cold because my father always keeps the house cold. And, you know, we're trying to take care of my mother and from a kind of Oedipal Freudian standpoint, it's a total traumatic nightmare. <laughs> like, you don't want to be seeing your mother naked dealing with you know, poop and all this kind of stuff. It's not for the faint of heart. Um, but our relationship is different and better because of it. Even though she is not the person she was before, that unknown unknown for me 
has opened up a totally different register of relationship with her. It's not the old relationship, but it's a new one. It's a different one. And if we can get to that space through design, to a space where we don't know quite what we're doing, we're controlling less, where we can actually get at something more profound than romantic fantasies of what well-being is, but well-being as this complicated, complex, nuanced, violent, scary, kind of well-being. That's the truth of what life is. It is a roller coaster ride. We need to explore a more complex, a more open-ended. We need to find the unknown unknowns about what experience is, what well-being is. It's not a picture of happy white people doing yoga. It's something more than that. We need a deeper, more complex set of truths about human existence. That my relationship to my mother is different and better, it is expanded in new realms because of the fear, the anxiety, the trauma of helping her. That's the kind of things that design needs to get to. And so the unknown unknowns for me are sort of life and death. It is this complexity, it is the nuance, it's the messiness, it's the scariness, it's the unknown. It's the having to go home and help with someone. It's the having to think about life and death in the way that Julie Jonas Sorbonis does in that thing, to recognize that death may be a violently vital part of life. That's the unknown, that's the well-being we need to get towards. Not segues, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and smart jump ropes, but something very different. And so, for me, the unknown unknowns is a space, it's a, it's a, it's a promise of design opening up a space, as many of our previous presenters just described, where we can experience a different, messier, harder, different truth. Fiction takes us there, cinema takes us there, poetry takes us there, and now hopefully design can take us there. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I also want to give everybody a chance to uh, ask Jamer any questions you, you have. So we'll spend a round of like five minutes to uh, reflect on uh, what Jamer shared. And if you have any questions, please raise your hand and we, get, we can get the microphone to you. for your presentation. Um, I'm curious about the role of transdisciplinary studies. Um, and I was wondering about the ways in which you can start to pivot and open up disciplines that might be a bit more closed unto themselves, that don't allow space for uncertainty. Yeah. And I'm curious, you know, how do transdisciplinary studies do that, and what are key questions that even start that process? Yeah, um, and it's been interesting. Thank you. That's a great question, and it's been interesting because um, just uh, uh, so I have the word transdisciplinary in way too many parts of my titles. It's like I need a short word. And I'm working on it. Um, but uh, so I started a transdisciplinary design program I'm at the new school. I'm now a vice provost of transdisciplinary initiatives, um, and so I'm I'm stuck with that term a lot. And so I'm glad you asked about it. Um, the unknown unknowns for me is starting to get at something finally that you know I think has been there all along um, in both my own practice and in my own thinking about where education and process should go towards. And it is to try and find those surprises, those unanticipated outcomes that can't often come <laughs> from disciplinary practice. I, I wouldn't say they can't come from, but they can't often come simply because they're bounded in a sense of a kind of bounded rationality, they're bounded by the constraints of the disciplines themselves. And so for me, what is the incredible promise of the sort of transdisciplinary the idea for me, as I sort of define it, it's really the idea of kind of bringing people together to transcend disciplinary 
boundaries and transcend disciplinary <coughs> outcomes. Um, so you can explore sort of something that doesn't belong to anybody. Um, that the opportunity is multiple. One, it helps to reframe. So when you are talking about bicycling in a city, for instance, and you might get bicyclists together and you might get policy experts together, but what if you also get bus drivers in that conversation? You know, suddenly that conversation changes. And it changes because, as some of the earlier presenters pointed out, those different points of view, the nursing, uh, excuse me, the cleaning staff in a hospital, um, you know, we so limit ourselves to kind of experts that we don't realize the expertise is embedded in everybody, just in different sorts of ways. It's, you know, it's, it's a bit like um, the future, it's just unequally distributed, as William Gibson famously said. Um, and so, expertise is there, it's just unequally distributed, and if we can get at that, we can start to reframe the assumptions that we bring to these kinds of problems. So I think it's, um, and, and to my mind, you know, there's, I'm not saying that all education and all approaches have to be this way, but we have a lot of universities and a lot of consultancies and whatever that do the kind of disciplinary thing, that's great, keep doing it. You know, amazing things have been produced. But as we saw from some of the presentations today, when you open up the question and you, and you sort of give up control over what's happening, you play a role more as a kind of catalyst, as a sort of facilitator to build a scaffolding for things to happen, things that you can't control and outcomes you don't know in advance. I think Lynn's presentation right before was perfect. You know, the lessons he learned through that process were not the lessons he set out to learn, and yet they were essential to where he needs to go. And he did that, in a sense, by failing, giving up, listening, getting feedback, letting others be the experts, letting them do the best work that they can do. Um, and that's how you start to create that. You only could do that, I think, by loosening up your own kind of bounded expertise and bringing in others who can, who, you know, challenge that um, and who can work with you. And it's not easy work. It's never easy because it's hard to work together with people you don't agree with on basic fundamental ways of seeing the world. So I'm not suggesting it's an easy thing, but more and more for me in thinking about my role at the university, it's how can I set up structures, scaffolds, lattices, where we can start to explore the unknown unknowns rather than just the known unknowns. The university traditionally has been to the purview of the known unknowns. We need to research more about this, and that's important work. I don't at all mean to denigrate it, but there's also an opportunity. I think this is also where design, I, I hate to sort of privilege design as a practice, but design does bring some, some unique capacities to the conversation, and one of those is divergent thinking. And so, Designers do have a role to play in all this because they help people to think divergently, to move beyond their own sense of what's possible. Um, so the reframing is important, the collaboration is important, this sort of de-escalating of hierarchy is important, the, the, the giving up of control is important, um, and being willing, almost an evolutionary kind of sensibility, to, to, to let things flow and unfold and see what emerges and pick from the best and build on that, that's kind of the model to me. And you don't know where it'll go, but I, my hope is it goes somewhere interesting. Thanks. Uh, hi, thanks. That was an excellent talk. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, I'm going to try to keep this question concise if I can. There's a lot of topics that have been touched on here that I think are really important. Uh, this idea of des um, design as policy and sort of perhaps inversely as policy as design, mm -hmm. medium being the culture itself, yep. uh, you have issues of violence, uh, questions of truth that were brought up before, uh, and politics which sort of use all these things together. So I guess, you know, looking into a uh, uh, political situation that seems deeply uncurious, which is really anathema uh -huh. to design, yeah. and design thinking, how do you see the role of design in affecting, sort of, like, can be applied towards the current politics? Oh, man. Thank you. Good question. And this is what, this is what we're all asking ourselves. And I think everybody in every profession is asking themselves this. And it really is, um, it's hard to explain, probably, maybe not, maybe in your own history here you have it. It's hard to explain what has happened and how bad it feels. Um, it is a punch in the solar plexus. People are stunned 
and they can't quite breathe. And the number of people like myself who sort of said, come Friday, the 21st of January, um, I might throw up. I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, it's, uh, it's so hard to reconcile how we thought we saw the world and what is happening. And it's not just happening, obviously, in the United States, it's happening globally. And, you know, I think a number of things, as, as several of you said uh, in, in the Q&A after the last panel, part of it is just to start making things and doing things. We have to. Um, part of it is to listen to more people and different people. Um, I don't really relish the idea of listening to bigots or racists. Um, or misogynists, uh, that's not necessarily things I need to listen to, but there are other things we do need to listen to, and I, for one, know that I exist in, a, in an awful bubble, uh, as everyone has recognized in the past, and that, that has to change somehow. And it is part of this transdisciplinary question, it's about hearing different stories along the way. Um, I also think we have to just become so much more political, um, that, that we do have some tactical capacities in design to shape images, to shape messages, um, to shape behavior. And we have to see these not as just commercial opportunities, but as uh, life or death political opportunities, because it's coming to that. It's never, it's, it's always been that for lots of populations, but for those of us who've been privileged to live you know, beyond the sort of threshold of survival, uh, it's rarely felt that way. You know, uh, we've now woken up perhaps in a way that we didn't expect, and I think we have to continue to see this as um, a very, very serious struggle, um, and one that's not going to go away anytime soon, and one that is historical and transnational. Um, and, but I also think you know, that there's another part to this which goes to sort of you know, the, the unknown unknowns in some ways. The thing I've always felt, with a few exceptions, is that um, when I travel around the United States or wherever, especially the rural areas, like, people are people. You know, they all want the same things pretty much. They might have different attitudes, they might have different kind of perspectives on the world, but most people are good people who want to do good things, and, and we don't need to be so polarized. And so I think that's the other part of all this, is that, you know, just, it sort of sickens me that we've created this caricature that in the United States, at least, we're so deeply divided. I don't think we are. Uh, I think we have people who can capitalize by using divisiveness as a kind of media weapon, and they do it very artfully uh, and successfully. But I also think that we're not that divided. I think people want, you know, a few basic things in their lives. I think the kind of unknown unknown for all of this is that we share much more than divides us, and we need to get back to that somehow. We need to find those things, and you know, and part of that kind of, you know, part of the unknown unknown might be. Maybe Trump is the answer, you know, like, as hard as it is for me to say that or admit that, I would absolutely agree with his diagnosis of the American political system that it is deeply broken. Now, his analysis may be different from mine about the why, but it is absolutely true that it is built upon very, very narrow moneyed interests. And <clears throat> until we change that, um, it's not going to get any better. So, you know, maybe there are weird things we share. Um, and that's part of what we, I think we have to be open to, is that we don't have all the answers, and, and as much as I fear everything he says and does and can do, um, I also think we can't just uh, run and hide and stick our heads in the sand. So, yeah, a complicated answer to a very complicated question. <laughs> Thank you. Although I still have a lot of questions to ask, but I know it's been a long day, and uh, we've kept you longer than uh, it was planned. So I just want to thank uh, Jamer first for uh, his inspiring talk and also all the speakers. <laughs> and also for all the speakers who uh, really contributed to the content of uh, our symposium today and I think it was really inspiring and great for all of us to learn from their experiences and their projects. I also would like to thank the team for making this happen, the AV team and uh, the photographers and uh, the videographers and everybody that helps make this happen every year. 
and thank you for uh, staying late and make sure you enjoy the rest of the festival we have still tonight and tomorrow. Uh, go around town and enjoy uh, the exhibitions and the events and uh, hope to see you again next year. I just add, if I can, since I have the microphone, um, I started in Philadelphia, something called Design Philadelphia, which is very similar to this festival. I know what goes into it, I know how hard it is. It takes a few incredibly dedicated people who have full time jobs and do this extra hours on weekends, round the clock. They, they contribute so much to it. Simon, I know, is one, there are probably many others. Toronto will be a better, different, amazing city because of this. Uh, it, these things often exist by a thread. Uh, support it financially, support it by going to events, but most of all, support it by giving him an incredible round of applause.